Can you hear me? Thumbs up. Yay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm guessing um, what I was saying, you couldn't hear. And I am still admitting a lot of people to join. We are now 65. Hold on a second because we are done. And okay, I was. I will introduce myself again. My name is Nelly. Hi, I'm the Standing Board Chair, and we're happy, very happy to have you all here. Um, we are experimenting in our first meeting via Zoom, and uh, Professor Lakoff was kind enough to allow us to do this and present for us. Um, I will tell you a little about Dr. Lakoff, um, he is the Edward A. Dickinson Professor Emeritus of Political Science. And the subject will be the politics of the pandemic. Can Trump turn a fiasco into four more years? Uh, Professor Lakoff, could you test uh, um, your microphone and see if we can hear you, please? Yes, how is this for sound? Excellent, is everybody able to hear? Please thumbs up. Excellent, thank you. And um, I would like to say a little about Professor Lakoff. Um, Dr. Lakoff is the founding chair of the department and distinguished scholar in polit political philosophy and science and public policy. Between others, he's the author of Equality in Political Philosophy, Democracy, History, Theory and Practice, and he has contributed over 50 essays to edited volumes, journals, and encyclopedias. Please help me welcome Dr. Leica. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> Please go ahead, Dr. Leica. Well, thank you. First of all, I, I do want to thank uh, Nellie for taking this initiative and Jan Oren and everybody in Oceanus. I think it's great that you're doing this and it's been wonderful for me because it's given me something to do. And of course, it's a uh, Pleasure to have a large audience. It's, it's something of a captive audience, I, I have to say. Um, but, uh, and of course, you'll notice in the background, uh, if you've been watching all these television interviews, everybody has a, a bookshelf or two in the background. Oh, well, I carefully arranged that here. And the only difference is that in this case, the eye level shelves are my own work. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, let's get on with it. Um, we naturally think of a pandemic as a me medical and scientific event, but it's also a political challenge. Um, only doctors and nurses can treat those infected. Only research biologists can find out how to disable or contain the virus. But until uh, therapies and vaccines are, can be brought to bear, agencies of government are critical in preventing harm, including uh, economic damage. They alone can marshal the necessary measures of public health and encourage and enforce adherence uh, to them. And they alone can fund and coordinate the research needed to find the causes and cures. On these scores, pandemics and politics intersect. In the case of COVID-19, Lori Garrett, uh, Garrett the winner of a Pulitzer Prize for her previous um, work on epidemics, has shown that both President Trump and President Xi of China have dealt badly with the virus because they govern autocratically. They've used their power, she, she says, to minimize potential damage to their regimes, and here I paraphrase, by repressing news of the true danger of the respective outbreaks and the reach of their, the infection zones. And as she said, showing parallel, if historically distinct brands of authoritarian rule, they both sought to dismiss the counsel of suspect health professionals and other experts. And in so doing, they lost the opportunity uh, to take uh, early steps that uh, could have contained the spread and lethality of the virus. She draws a disturbing conclusion and I'm quoting here from an article she did. The larger political story of the 2020 coronavirus crisis may well prove to be a powerful case study in the way that governments controlled by leaders prone to unilateral decision-making 
and top-down information regimes they rely on to perpetuate their rule are all but guaranteed to create maximum conditions of public health breakdown. Now, in formerly authoritarian countries like China, a ruler who inflicts unnecessary suffering can stay in power until overthrown by a palace coup or a revolution. Here, the national election in November will be, to an important degree, a referendum on the management of the crisis by our elected representatives, especially President Trump and his administration. But the pandemic has struck uh, when our politics is more sharply polarized than perhaps at any time since the run-up to the uh, Civil War. The polarization is already affecting the response in Congress, in the White House, in the blue and red uh, states and localities. And it probably will be very much reflected in the way the electorate divides in November, despite the widespread recognition of the need for national unity at a time of such danger. And that's really what I want to talk about um, today. In the face of the mounting illness and death that COVID-19 has wrought, the administration is touting its supposed success. This at a time when in less than two months, we've lost more Americans to the coronavirus than in Vietnam, Persian, the Vietnam, the Persian Gulf, Afghanistan, and Iraq wars combined. <clears throat> Jared Kushner is reputed to be President Trump's closest confidant, even the adjunct president, which proves the truth of the old saying, the son-in-law also rises. He has called the administration's response to the virus a great success story. Trump himself has been equally unstinting in self-congratulation. We did a spectacular job, he said. These claims boggle the mind. By any objective standard, the Trump administration has been dilatory, chaotic, and grossly ineffective in managing the crisis. Trump's predecessor, President Obama, followed the recommendation of specialists on pandemics by establishing the White House uh, National Security Council Directorate for Global Health Security and Biodefense an early warning system for infectious uh, diseases uh, in, in developing areas. Trump disbanded it in 2018. And Susan Rice, Obama's national security advisor, who set up the system, has eviscerated Trump's preposterous claim that he inherited a broken system of monitoring. And I quote from what Susan Rice has said. We left them a 69-page playbook which I called Pandemics for Dummies, which was designed to enable an administration to walk through a set of issues and questions and begin to prepare a response. They dismantled the office, discarded the playbook. They disregarded the exercise we pre prepared for them to enable them to work through these kind of issues in the transition. And they never prioritized pandemics as the catastrophic threat we all knew it could be. Indeed, for three and a half years, the Trump administration, I'm now speaking for myself, for three and a half years, the Trump administration did nothing to prepare for the next SARS-like outbreak that epidemiologists thought was inevitable. When news of the outbreak uh, in China reached our intelligence agencies in December and January, um, the, uh, the agencies warned Trump repeatedly in daily briefings that it could come here. He not only ignored the warnings, but fired an official in Homeland Security for alerting Congress to the threat. And after he finally took public notice that a terrible outbreak was racing through Wuhan, he wasted weeks reassuring Americans not to worry because as he said, we have it totally under control. He seems to have been anxious not to jeopardize an agribusiness friendly trade deal with China, and the full employment economy he was counting on to win re-election. But because of his inaction, the pandemic has been far more devastating than it's been elsewhere, notably in South Korea and Germany, where prompt action checked the spread. The current gap in testing between Trump's boasts 
and the inadequacies on the ground is just the latest example of this terrible record. And to make matters worse, Trump is urging the states to lift restrictions even when they ignore the criteria set by his own experts with his endorsement. Goaded by uh, his most rabid followers and with his encouragement, states and localities are reopening businesses and lifting social distancing requirements before robust testing, isolation, and contract, contact tracing are in place, and of course, risking more waves of infection and death. The remedy <clears throat> the democracies have for incompetent or corrupt leaders is to throw the bums out at the next election. Trump's critics have every reason to wish that come November, he will go down like a martini made of Clorox with a dash of Lysol. He has been the most inept crisis manager we have ever had in the White House, and the only one as openly inhumane. Lori Garrett does not exaggerate when she calls him the most incompetent, foolhardy buffoon imaginable. But he is also one of those demagogic leaders Eric Frome warned about, warned about in Escape from Freedom. Who's the, people whose very megalomania convinces people who feel powerless that he is their champion and makes them willing to follow him like lemmings, even to perdition. When Hitler rose to power, a perceptive German intellectual wrote a book with a provocative title, Kleiner Mann, was nun, little man, what now? It remains to be seen whether the appeals that led 63 million Americans to elect Trump will work again and lead us even farther along the road from liberal democracy to authoritarian populism. In a year as volatile as this one, caution is in order in predicting the outcome of an election, even one only six months away. Only a few months ago, many observers were confident that Trump would go into the election bearing the scarlet leather of impeachment and that a resounding majority of voters would pronounce the guilty verdict that the Republican Senate majority spared him. Who thinks about um, uh, the impeachment trial now? A month or two earlier, ahead of the South Carolina primary, it looked like Bernie Sanders would be his opponent. Sanders has now endorsed uh, Biden and um, some of his most rabid followers uh, uh, are uh, uh, supporting him um, and um, uh, 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 actually raising uh, money for him, for him. Before the COVID crisis, it was also beginning to seem as though the Republican determination to kill Obamacare by a thousand cuts would backfire <coughs> because more low income workers and rural voters were getting anxious about losing health insurance. Now, millions of people who live from paycheck to paycheck are worried not just about health insurance, but even about how they can stave off eviction and famine. As of now, economic hardship and Trump's perceived failures have swung public opinion against him. Um, uh, but one report uh, has noted that although Biden is ahead of Trump in the polls in the swing states, Hillary Clinton was ahead of him by even higher margins at this point in 2016 in those states. And if public opinion is volatile now, it's even more so, uh, it was volatile then, it's even more so now. And of course, we have to bear in mind that although Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by something like uh, two point million votes, she lost in the, uh, uh, under, under the electoral vote uh, framework. And even if it turns out that the election is a referendum on his leadership or lack of it in this crisis, that judgment needs to be unpacked. <coughs> and presidents are often credited with economic expansions for which they uh, were not responsible. The same may be true for the credit or blame that attaches to Trump, given the state of the virus in November, especially if we bear in mind that public opinion is shaped by campaign spin and media, media manipulators who draw the largest audiences, like Fox News, Flax, and Rush Limbaugh, the toady Trump awarded the, na to the nation's highest honor to. If the curve of infection and death turns lower, Trump, Trump could reap the benefit. 
no matter that it will result from measures taken by the states and heroic doctors and nurses, sometimes in the face of obstacles he created, like forcing the states to compete against each other for supplies. <clears throat> if a vaccine is ready for mass production by September, as Pfizer has forecast, a wave of euphoria could revive the repressed animal spirits of consumers and investors alike. Many Americans could believe, as Herbert Hoover tried to assure an earlier generation, that economic recovery is around the corner. Only this time they may be right, provided, of course, that the viral scourge does not come roaring back before a vaccine is available. The remarkable fact is that despite all his missteps and offenses against decency, Trump's support has barely wavered since he took office. Every survey for the past three and more years has shown that between 40 and 50% of the electorate uh, steadily supports him. His current approval rating of about 43% is uh, about the same as that of Reagan and Obama at the same stage of their first terms. Trump's most ardent followers still support him enthusiastically. They tell reporters that they admire him because he tells it like it is, and because he has stopped the immigrant caravan and is building the wall by executive fiat, Congress be damned. They wear MAGA hats, wave the flag, both American and Confederate, and think social distancing violates their right to freedom. <clears throat> if they've stuck with him all this time, through rising inequality, thanks to tax cuts that favor the wealthy, despite his indifference to the separation of immigrant children from their parents, his routine defamation of national heroes like John McCain and all his political rivals, why should those 40 to 50% not vote for him again? And remember, last election, as I said, turned on electoral votes, not the popular vote, and specifically on the electoral vote of a handful of closely contested swing states, which are currently closely contested. In the latest poll, Trump is ahead of Biden uh, in six battleground states. Trump's supporters are drawn to him for a variety of reasons. Some cheer his strident nationalism, summed up in the slogan, America First, a slogan that brings shudders to those aware that it supported appeasement in the late 1930s. Some share his xenophobia and his all but blatant racism and ethnocentrism. Some also have his populistic disdain for experts, including scientists, and for reporters determined to hold politicians accountable. Many see him as a champion of freedom and capitalism against statism and socialism. Others stand with him because uh, he appoints judges opposed to abortion and to what they call the gay agenda and the effort to deny religion a place in the public square. It's a heterogeneous collection, but a loyal one, so much so that his followers make up a grouping that is less a political party than a cult or tribe. In 1960, a Stanford political scientist polled Democrats and Republicans about how they would feel about one of their children marrying someone affiliated with the other party. Only 5% of either party said it would concern them. In 2010, 49% of Republicans and 33% of Democrats said it would be unacceptable. Republicans once endorsed the Heritage Foundation approach to health care, embodied in Romney care in Massachusetts and then in Obamacare. Today, they are united in seeing it as a grave danger to personal liberty. Not very long ago, a Republican president said, I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and lived here, even though sometime back they may have arrived illegally. That president was no less a revered right winger than Ronald Reagan. Would any Republican politician dare say that now? If the virus seems better contained, voters may rationalize their support for Trump by parodying his oft-repeated claim that he saved lives by banning foreigners coming from China. Even though, as the fact checkers point out, that ban did not include people who brought the virus from China via Europe, which is how it got to New York, or that it came too late after the virus had already arrived and begun to spread uh, on the West Coast. Was it his fault that the CDC failed initially to develop test kits that worked? It may actually have been his fault because he cut the personnel of the CDC. 
They will point out that he sent Navy medical vessels to New York and LA, ordered beds to be set up in the New York's Javits Center in record time, that he finally did get GM and Ford to produce ventilators um, and other badly needed equipment, that he listened to Drs. Fauci, Fauci and Birks in agreeing to a phased reopening, even as he sent confused messages and kept predicting that it would over, be over by Easter and then by Memorial Day. They will point to the relief efforts such as Paycheck Protection and the CARES Act that he signed into law with checks needlessly bearing his signature. By insisting that the states handle the crisis, they will say he didn't show a failure of national leadership, but a strict constitutionalist respect for states' rights and limited government, and that by doing so, he forced the states to deal with the crisis in a differential way and at the point of attack that was called for. If by election day, effective drugs are available and a vaccine is ready to be produced, his supporters will not suddenly admit that they were wrong to follow him in ignoring or attacking science, but instead will contend that um, his confidence in American resilience and his faith in miracles has triumphed. Uh, against all the efforts by his nefarious enemies from China to the media to the deep state to handicap and thwart him. His campaign managers have already decided to focus strongly on China, a gambit that deflects from his failures, revives the nationalistic appeal that served him so well in 2016, and resonates with widely shared resentments at China's deceptiveness and its military and economic challenge to America's standing in the world. Voters are moved, uh, of course, by more than mood swings. Presidential elections come down to a choice of imperfect candidates by impressionable voters with limited information. Some voters say they voted for Trump in 2016 because they had been led not to trust Hillary Clinton, crooked Hillary, as Trump never tired of defaming her. Others may have done so because they were reluctant to vote for a woman. Will some independents vote for Trump because they don't see Biden as a comfortable alternative? The Trump campaign is wasting no time pointing out that Biden, whom Trump likes to call Sleepy Joe, is gaff prone and sometimes confused about facts that he's showing signs of aging. The campaign contrasts um, Biden's efforts to, pro uh, to promote good relations with China, implying that his son profited from his diplomacy as he did in Ukraine with Trump's record of presumably standing up to China. Never mind that Trump praised President Xi as his good friend and lauded his transparency about uh, the virus. The Trump campaign, moreover, is very, has a very good war chest. Much, uh, it's got much more money to campaign with than, than Biden's. And you know, as a, as a famous politician once said, there are two important things about politics. Um, one is money and I forget the other. And to make matters worse, Biden is now also being accused of sexual assault by a campaign worker almost 30 years ago. Ardent Democrats will say that uh, better a one-time one sinner than a, a serial offender, but the accusation could depress turnout among those for whom the Me Too movement makes respect for women a prerequisite for any office. With respect for women in mind, Biden has pledged to pick one as his running mate. He's being pressed to make that choice a black woman. After all, support from black voters enabled this comeback in the primaries, and they make up the largest identity group in the Democratic poll. Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016 is often attributed to a relatively low black turnout. But it's questionable whether any of the black women prospects will strengthen the ticket in any other respect. Kamala Harris, Stacey Abrams, Susan Rice, and Val Demings are accomplished and talented, but they may not hold much appeal for independents generally or largely white swing state voters. Barack and Michelle Obama will certainly rally support for Biden among black voters, even if he picks Amy Klobuchar or Elizabeth Warren, but it is still a troublesome issue. Governor Cuomo might do more for the ticket because of the respect he has earned for pragmatic management of the virus crisis in New York. And he could be an appealing president in waiting should Biden serve only one term. But Biden will be hard pressed to keep his word unless the women candidates give him cover to do so. In view of the sexual assault accusation, that move seems unlikely. 
Could the convention decide to make Cuomo the head of the ticket if polls in the summer show Biden faltering against Trump? Who knows? In this year, anything is possible. And what will happen once the Democratic delegates name a ticket, probably via a virtual convention? What will the campaign, campaign be like if rallies are either ruled out or attended only by the foolhardy few? It used to be said that um, uh, California was unique because a political rally in our state was two people in front of a television set, uh, unlike states where candidates are expected to show up in person and press the flesh. Now they can't show their faces without a mask and they have to not shake, but only bump elbows, no kissing babies, or so much as touching a woman other than your spouse. If televised debates are held, will they pre be, be presented without audiences or with canned applause like baseball games and the movies? Will Trump decide he doesn't want to give Biden the benefit of high TV ratings and forego debates altogether? What role will social, me social media, both domestic and foreign, play in disseminating misinformation and influencing voting and non-voting? You may have seen in today's New York Times a full page ad urging the social media to exercise more control over that kind of stuff. But it's bound to be out there and it's bound to do damage. Um, as the all purpose metaphor now has it, we're in uncharted waters. What about the election itself? <clears throat> we saw what happened in Milwaukee when voters were forced to choose between risking their health and coming out to vote when they has to, had to stand in line in one of five polling places that replaced the usual 180. <clears throat> Turnout was suppressed, even though the Republican uh, strategy backfired, and some of those who stood in line <clears throat> did become infected. Other Republican state legislatures will surely follow Wisconsin's example in taking steps to suppress turnout. As of now, only five states have gone to complete mail-in voting. Others like California make it easy to opt for mail ballots, <clears throat> but some don't allow it except for absentee ballots, and even those sometimes require witnesses and notary publics. Texas allows you to get an absentee ballot if you have a good reason such as disability, and presumably that could clear, include fear of inflection. But don't put it past that state's Republican legislature to make that hard on the flimsy rationale that they're acting to ward off ballot harvesting. The technical problems in moving to mail-in voting are daunting, as was reported in the Washington Post, and I quote, the equipment that states have to conduct in-person elections won't work for mail-in elections. The scanners many states have to count ballots in each polling place can't handle counting ballots en masse from the whole country or state. The kind of scanner that can do that heavy work costs 500,000 to a million dollars. Also, states can't just mail out the ballots they already have printed. They have to design ballots that can be folded into an envelope. They also need to print instructions for how to fill it out and send it back. And they need to design the ballot to work for the Postal Service. Minnesota Secretary of State Steve Simon is considering moving to a mail-only election. He said part of that calculation is figuring out how to pay for postage for those ballots so no one has to go out and buy stamps. The staffing must change with a by mail election too. To run a day of election, states probably need several thousand poll workers willing to come in for 12 to 14 hours on a single day. For a by mail election, states may need a fraction of those staffers, but they'll need people who can work for weeks before the election, helping get it set up, and then weeks afterward, helping count the ballots. And then you have to train those people, which we, would be a challenge for an election official who has never done this before, end of quote. And what about campaign strategy? Is there a way for Biden to mount an effective challenge, even while he's stuck in the basement of his home in Delaware? Some observers say his best challenge is to let Trump be Trump. So far, that seems to have worked. But Biden has to guard against three dangers. One is that elements of the Democratic co coalition, especially the young voters who flock to Sanders, will not turn out in the numbers he needs. The second is that independents will be leery of voting for someone less vigorous than articulate as they would like, a feeling that has shown up in polls in New Hampshire. 
some votes uh, uh, that might go to Biden as the lesser evil could be siphoned off like an independent candidate like Congressman Amash. Third is the largely suburban women's vote. To overcome these dangers, he needs to present a clearer general idea of what he would do if elected and a list of those from whom he would recruit his cabinet. He would also do well to call for the creation of a council on pandemics and another on climate change. But it remains to be seen whether our tribal divisions will be overcome, not just in the election, but in what follows. Bear in mind that the race for the Senate is a very close call. I, for one, hope so, and hope, after all, elected Obama. But as the Scots say, I hate me dudes. And I'm hardly alone in feeling uneasy about the politics of the pandemic. The Irish writer, Fintan O'Toole, has expressed a sense of frustration and embarrassment that many Americans must share. And I'm going to quote him and, and uh, with that quote. Usually when this kind of outlandish idiocy is displaying itself, there is the comforting thought that if things were really serious, it would all stop. People would sober up. Instead, a large part of the US has hit the bottle even harder. And the president, his party, and their media allies keep supplying the drinks. There has been no moment of truth, no shock of realization that the antics have to end. No one of any substance on the US right has stepped in to say, get a grip, people are dying here. And to paraphrase uh, uh, <clears throat> Walter Cronkite, that's the way it is, unfortunately. Thank you, and that's it. Now we're ready for questions, I hope. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Please, thumbs up. Thank you so much, Professor Leka, for your presentation. And now we can, we are able to raise our hand. There is an icon under participants. And I have Robert Knox. Robert, I will unmute you so you can perform the question. Robert, Thank you. Go Thank ahead. Thanks, Sandy. That was great. Do you you made some considerable mention of the almost lemming-like cohesion of the Trump base, notwithstanding facts, notwithstanding truth, notwithstanding et cetera, et cetera? Do you see any sort of practical ways in which the Democratic side can? chip away at that concreteness between now and election day, blow some holes in it, either nationwide or in the principal swing states or anywhere else for that matter? What can be done? Well, I think the answer to your question is not what the Democrats can do, but what Republicans can do. And here I'm referring to the Lincoln group that's launched um, an ad that's really gotten under uh, his skin. And you know, there are people like Peter Weiner who worked for three Republican administrations uh, who've been very forthright in uh, telling it like it is, so to speak. And, um, and, and I, I am kind of hopeful that Mitt Romney will come out of his shell again, as he did briefly on the impeachment uh, process, um, and be honest about uh, what's going on. In short, I think that uh, the only thing that's going to really make a dent in that Republican coalition is if uh, Republicans themselves speak out uh, forcefully and uh, decide they're either not going to vote for Trump or they will vote for Biden. Thank you. Now we have Maria Penny. Uh, Maria, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, please. Maria, are you there? This is for Maria Penny. You are unmuted. Okay, I'm going to mute her back again. And we have Pat Nathan. Pat Nathan, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Pat Nathan. Hi, uh, we have two questions. The first is, uh, do you think uh, Trump might drop Pence in favor of a woman like Nikki Haley? And second, uh, do you think Trump, if he thinks he's going to lose, might try and postpone or do away with the election in November? Let me, let me answer the second question uh, first. We have never postponed an election, uh, no matter what the uh, crisis, and I don't think the country would stand for it. Um, so that's my answer to the first question. 
uh, the second question. As to the first, 